welcome to Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, break down the process, and meet others who've done it so you can leap into your own story. We interview amazing guests who provide powerful insights that inspire you to get your story told. Be sure to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com, and while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media network. Now sit back, get ready to take some notes, and let's get started. This episode of Leap Into Your Story podcast is brought to you by Leap Into Your Story course. Visit leapintoyourstory.com where you have a guide to get your story told. I'm Victoria Anderson. Welcome to Leap Into Your Story podcast where you discover your inner story work through the process, and meet others who've done it. We interview amazing guests who provide powerful insights that will inspire you to leap into your own story. Be sure to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com. And while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media networks. So let's get started. In this episode... We are going to find out about how to pitch projects. And my guest today is Douglas J. Ebach. Doug is a screenwriter best known for writing the original screenplay for Sweet Home Alabama, starring Reese Witherspoon. He wrote the prequel novels, Felony Melanie and Pageant Pandemonium, and Felony Melanie in the Big Smash Up. He's also written video games, Nightmare Cove, Sleepover at Stables, and Magi Road Trip. Included in his writing are short stories, Recon, published in Colored Lens, and Meet Space, published in Science Fictionary. He is also the author of three stages of screenwriting and co-author with producer Ken Agato of the Hollywood Pitching Bible. Doug, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Now, before we dive into some questions, let us know a little more about yourself and your writing journey. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Um, So I guess I started um, you know, of course, I, I started in the in film and working in as a screenwriter. Um, and my interest in that really started, uh, like many people of my generation with the movie Star Wars. Um, I saw that when I was a little kid and kind of was blown away and obsessed with it. And, um, you know, I would read everything I could about it. This is back in the pre internet days, pre DVD extra days. Um, so uh, my dad's Time magazine um, came in the mail and it had R2-D2 and C-3PO on it. So I broke that open and read that. And um, I started reading about this guy, George Lucas, who had um, came up with all of this stuff in Star Wars. Uh, and I thought, wow, that sounds like a, a really cool job. I think maybe I'd like to do that for a living. Um, and, you know, it's probably really the first time I really thought about the fact that people made movies, that that was a job. And you know, in my life, I really, there's, you know, I didn't know anybody in the film business. I wasn't related to anybody. So um, that did two things. One is nobody said, that's crazy. You can't do that. So, um, which was good. Um, And then on the other hand, like I had no idea how to do that. So, um, you know, so my parents um, who both had PhDs um, said, well, you know, how you get it, how you work in a business is you go to college and learn how to do that. So figure out where you go to college to learn to be a film director, which is, you know, what I was wanting to do at the time. Um, so, you know, I went to high school in Alaska um, where nobody knew anything about, you know, I said to my guidance counselor, I want to go to film school. And she said, what's that? So um, I did research again, pre-internet. So I didn't really, you know, I, we had big books of like, these are the schools for these programs. And um, I applied to several places, but I knew George Lucas had gone to USC. So I applied there as one of the places and got in. Um, so that's where I ended up going to film school um, and majoring in directing initially. Um, I'd, always, I'd always been interested in storytelling. Um, 
you know, even when I, another thing, when I was a little kid, if I saw a movie I really liked, I would come home and I'd draw comic books of the sequel of that. So, you know, like what would happen to the characters after that? So I was always, you know, and I like to draw a lot. So I was always drawing or writing. I'd written some short stories in high school. I'd tried to start like three novels and got 10 pages in and then didn't quite know what I was doing. So <laughs> that all, you know, um, just those early experiments at writing. Um, but I went to film school and I kind of started doing more cinematography there. And when I graduated was working, you know, the entry level jobs in um, grip and electric type work, cin the camera side of things, um, you know, mostly working on commercials and music videos and one or two day jobs. And, and I still, and my whole thing was like, when I didn't have a job, when I wasn't working, I would write, um, work on screenplays. Um, and one of the things I wrote, then again, I still really didn't know anything. Um, uh, but in that period, I wrote um, a screenplay called Melanie's Getting Married, which ultimately became Pseudo Alabama, but that screenplay was nothing like it. I, I kind of finished that screenplay and said, it was a little bit of like a, um, like kind of a raunchy sex comedy type thing, like a Revenge of the Nerds. And I really, I finished the first draft and just thought, this isn't what I want to write. This isn't the kind of movie I want to do. So, um, so I just put it in a, in a, a drawer and never really looked at it again. Um, but around the, around that time, I was also realizing that cinematography wasn't my love either. Um, that it was a lot of carrying heavy boxes and working 14 hour days and, you know, um, you're an hour past lunch and getting hungry and everything. And, uh, there was kind of a saying in Hollywood about your most exciting day of your life is your first day on a set and your most boring day is the second day. <laughs> so, Cause it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do the production side of things. Um, so I ended up going back to film school and studying screenwriting because I was kind of, you know, really enjoying that part of it more. Um, and then I, I reached a point towards um, where we, so we had to do, it was a two-year program, it was back at USC again, a two-year program for the graduate screenwriting program. Um, and then you wrote for your master's thesis, it was a screenplay. Um, so the last year you were, we were supposed to be writing the screenplay and I had gotten to about, um, Thanksgiving working on this one idea and it just wasn't coming together. I couldn't really figure it out. And I thought, man, I'm going to, if I don't get this solved soon, I'm going to, um, I'm not going to graduate on time. I'm going to have to take another semester. And, you know, it's a very expensive private school and I didn't want to do that. So I thought, uh, you know, I, I wrote that script, Melanie's getting married and, and I kind of always liked the character and I liked the title. And, um, and so I came up with a different approach to it. It was, it had always been about a woman who goes back home. She was going to get married, but she has to go back home to solve a problem. But I said, you know, what if it's more of a romantic comedy? And her problem is that she's still married and she has to get a, a divorce. So, and I thought, you know, romantic comedy is basically, there's only like three structures. For romantic comedy, you know, and I, I've tried to break that structure and do something different. And it just doesn't, you know, there's a reason why it is because it was a, a certain artificiality to romantic comedies, you know, where like in real life, when people like each other, they just get together and like, there's no movie there. So, you know, um, so I like, you know, romantic comedy, I know what the structure is. I'll be able to finish the, the script. Um, so I wrote that um, after college, you know, this was also, I was fortunate to graduate in an era where Hollywood was really looking for original scripts. You know, um, that was really something that, you know, everybody was searching for that hot new writer and it's not that way now. Um, but I was able to get an agent, um, you know, over a, ser a several year period, it didn't happen overnight, but I was able to get an agent and eventually sell the script. And of course it got made. And um, that was, I didn't realize at the time quite how rare that was. I thought, oh, this is easy. You know, you write a script and then they buy it and it gets made hit movie. And, um, you know, so that's kind of how I got into writing. Um, and then you know, as the business changed, so a lot of my work has been in film and television, but I've always been interested in other things. And, um, you know, I was able to, I, I, because I wrote the original script, I kept the novelization rights uh, for the movie. So um, that's why I wrote these prequel novels, the Felony Melanie novels um, uh, with my sister who uh, was a YA author. So that was kind of a good thing because she brought that YA novelist side and I brought the, like the storytelling and knowledge of the world and characters and so that was a good collaboration. I learned a lot. Um, uh, you know, and I wrote some plays and I've written some short stories and things. So I just started doing other things um, and doing a lot of work in Hollywood on, you know, projects that didn't get made, which is another big challenge of Hollywood is, um, there, you know, most stuff doesn't get made if you're talking about the feature film world. So, um, you know, it's been satisfying to be able to write other kinds of things uh, and, and to see them come to life as well. So. 
Yes. Well, that is quite the adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, yes, I've, I've heard quite a bit of things get, even if the pitch does go through, they get shelved and they're never made into it. So with that intro, let's go ahead and dive into some questions. And the first one is, how did you learn to pitch? I hear that this is probably one, if not the most um, important element of getting your script uh, in motion and into some step of production. Right. Yeah. I, it's so for the, for the screenwriters, um, you know, Hollywood is a very in-person kind of business. So a lot of things that might happen, you know, it, it, it's, it's not so different than for a novelist doing a book proposal, right? Except we have to do it in person. So there's always, you know, everybody wants to meet in person. Um, and so you have to do live verbal pitching. Um, for me, so the interesting thing uh, for me graduating from that program is, so, the, I, you know, there was a lot of interest in the script. The script went out. Um, it did not sell right away, as I said. Um, but, um, I, you know, I had this agent and he'd send it everywhere. And so I got all these meetings and I was told, you know, go into the meeting and pitch something. And I didn't really know how to do it. So I went in and did, I think what most writers do and would do um, is to just kind of like start trying to tell the story from beginning to end in 15 minutes, um, which really does not work. Uh, it's, you know, that's, that's kind of an, uh, not a good way to pitch. So, you know, after being really bad at it for a while, I started to figure out and talk to people that had been successful kind of whenever I could. I started to figure out a little more how to do it. Um, uh, and then, you know, I also had some experiences, like I got hired to go, uh, by, the, by the Singapore government to come over there with a couple of other screenwriters to help develop their film industry a little bit, um, or give it more of an international kind of uh, spin that American screenwriters, you know, are more aware of kind of the global marketplace, I guess, was the idea. Um, as part of that, we did a pitch fest uh, where the writers pitched ideas to producers and I got to observe that and then talk to the producers about what worked and didn't work. Um, and so gradually over time, um, both by, you know, first of all, trial and error and making a lot of mistakes. Um, and then eventually by kind of like really trying to figure out like, how does this work and what works and doesn't work? Um, and then kind of, a, a, you know, around that time, I also, uh, I was teaching at um, Art Center College in Pasadena and um, I had mentioned to the department head that we really needed a pitching class because I said, you know, that's, that's all you do early in your career as a screenwriter. Um, and nobody taught me how to do it. And we don't have a class on that and we should be teaching people. Um, and he's, and he kind of said, that's a great idea. You should teach that. And I said, well, wait a minute, did I tell you the part about where I'm not any good at it? But um, uh, I paired up with the, with the producer, Ken Aguado, um, and we kind of created this. And so the idea was like, he's been a, he's a producer and had been a studio executive. And so he'd heard hundreds of pitches and I'm a writer who had done hundreds of pitches. And so we kind of sat down and really came up with a, um, like a, an outline, not, we didn't invent anything. We kind of figured out how people who are good at it do it and put terms to a lot of it. Um, uh, and so that really kind of, you know, and then we, we ended up writing this book, um, the Hollywood pitching Bible, um, out of basically what hands out handouts in class that had grown to 30, 40, 50 pages. And we said, you know, we should make this into a book, um, uh, so that we can have the students read the book and then also, you know, kind of, uh, sell it. So, um, so that's kind of how I learned to do it. Um, and, and how the book came about. Um, I would also say that like, the thing I've also learned is that um, I take a more of a broader approach to pitching. Um, so certainly as a screenwriter, um, there are, you know, there's very formal pitching, right? You go into a meeting and you're pitching a project or in many cases, especially these days, you're pitching on an assignment. So there's a book or a, a current screenplay they won't rewritten or a comic book or whatever. Um, there was just a movie that came out based on a tweet thread. So, so in many cases, you're given this underlying material and you come in and you pitch to get the job. Um, uh, but pitching really is just anytime you have to convince someone of, of your idea, right? That your idea has merit. Explain what your idea is and, and convince them that it has merit. Um, and I think it's really, 
you know, it's useful as a novelist, you know, when you're, if you're doing book proposals or if you have to write a synopsis, which often people ask you to do a synopsis. And, and again, it's the same challenge actually is all that stuff is a pitch. So if you're trying to write a synopsis and all you do is kind of plot from A to Z, but without all the good stuff, then, you know, that's not really going to, going to work. So the synopsis is a pitch it is a sales tool. Um, and even just when you're at a, at a party and networking or whatever, and someone says, what are you working on? You know, being able to convey your idea in a way that's clear, that's, that's pretty key to success, I think. Okay, nice. Now that brings me to the next question is, how does pitching fit into your writing life and how much pitching should you expect to be doing? Um, you know, I mean, or how much you should be prepping for maybe, that might be another question. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, so I think if you want to work professionally as a writer, um, and I was, I've worked in a lot of different media, which I think is kind of the reality of writers today, you know, um, you're going to have to sell your stuff at some point, you know, whether that's, um, you know, just a, a query letter, you know, a query letters, a kind of pitch. Um, so again, like Hollywood has this very formal thing we call pitching, but any of that, it's all the same thing. Um, and, you know, and I think really, to me, the, the, everybody thinks of pitching or many people think of pitching as like this salesmanship, right? And it's like this razzle dazzle or something like that. And, and, you know, so a lot of writers, of course, resist that. They don't like that um, for whatever reason, either because they are, you know, the kind of personality that makes you a writer tends not to be that very outgoing razzle dazzle type personality, or you feel like you're compromising your art in some way. But um, to me, really like the, the kind of realization that I came to much later than I should have is that, it's really just about, you know, kind of conveying what your idea is, first of all, um, because they don't know, right? The person you're trying to, your editor or agent or, or producer, they have no idea what, you're, what you've got. Um, convey it to them and like also convey what's really cool about it. Um, and so kind of to me, the, the tragedy of it all is if a writer, a writer might have something really great, but if they can't express it well, um, you know, it never gets to the buyer who might really love it if they could. Get it. So, you know, it's really about that. Like, it's a lose for everybody if if the writer doesn't properly present their their material, their idea. Um, and it's hard. You know, it's like it's a it's a big challenge. Um, you're condensing something big into you know a very little amount of time. You're usually stripping out all the stuff that's really interesting about the thing. You know, the the dialogue and the language and all those little details. Um, so, how do you kind of capture what's good in that pitch? So. Um, so I think, you know, like, obviously it, it is a sales process, right? If you're just writing stuff for your own enjoyment, you don't need to pitch, but if you want it to be published or you want readers to read it, or you want, you know, producers to buy it and make it into a movie, then um, that just, that's kind of, that's the intersection between you've, you've got this idea, you've got this thing, and then you're trying to sell. I mean, the other thing is certainly in Hollywood, um, you know, you can write scripts on spec and you can submit them, but that is a very... Um, low, uh, you have a low batting average at going at that approach. And so it's again, hard to make a living, hard to make that a career. If that's all you're going to do, you're going to have to try to pitch assignments. And I think even for, you know, most fiction writers are, the, are, you know, some of them will just write the book first, but in many cases you're doing proposals and things and trying to, trying to get jobs. Um, the other thing, like kind of the, the interesting side note of, or side discovery of pitching is that when you learn to pitch well, you, you actually, it, what it requires is to really understand your own idea and the, and the, like the DNA of it. And also like what is cool about it. And it seems like, well, of course, you know, but I think sometimes you don't, right? <laughs> like you may have a really cool idea. I hear a lot of writers um, pitch me something and I'm like, you're, you're leaving out the most cool part of what you came up with, <laughs> you know, like the, thing, the most interesting thing. And, um, and so by, so I, I kind of feel like it's even if you're not going to pitch something, even if you're going to just write it on spec, um, developing the pitch before you write can really help you figure out what it is you've got. You know, it can really help you find the idea, find the core and the heart of the idea um, first. And that can be, so it can really benefit your writing to, to learn how to, you know, kind of understand ideas in that way. Nice. Now I'm kind of curious. So I mean, when you're pitching, the the win-win goal is to you know you as a screenwriter to make money and whoever's going to put that into production to make money but when you're in the pitch 
are you pitching the story and letting the production person or the producer determine if that's the money maker <laughs> or are you selling it to this is going to be a popular to a, a lot of our audience that would like this story yeah i think i mean i really it's it's the former right it's the you know like i got this great idea and then i'm and i'm really passionate about it that's actually a key part of pitching right you're pitching yourself as much as as the story certainly in, in a in a hollywood in-person pitch that's crucial um you, you know you you have to have some sense of the marketplace Right, like you know, you have to have some sense of, of what is a viable idea, um, which in Hollywood oftentimes is related to budget. Because the problem uh, for you know writers or artists in Hollywood is that m movies and TV shows are enormously expensive. <laughs> you know, like like a six million dollar movie is a low budget movie, and who has six million dollars, right? So so you have to have some commercial consideration. There has to be some sense of like this could actually make money, even independent films. You know, nobody wants to lose money, so. Um, so there's that, and you have to also have some sense of who you're pitching to and what they might be interested in. You know, I wouldn't be going into someone who makes horror movies and pitching them a romantic comedy. Like that just, that, that's not, that's, no, there's no point in that. So, but, um, you know, your job as a writer is really the story and, and creating something that's good um, from a story standpoint, and their job is the business side. Um, and you also kind of don't, like, nobody really knows it's going to be a hit, otherwise they would make nothing but hits. So, <laughs> So there's always, you know, a sort of a gut instinct thing. And then, and then you, you also don't even know as much as they do about what the marketplace is right now and what they might be looking for. So, um, and then the other side of that is, you know, I've heard many executives say to me um, that, you know, a lot of times in a pitch, they want it, they'll take the writer who seems most enthusiastic because um, they know they're going to do a good job. Right. Like they know that that writer is going to put his heart and soul into that thing where if it just feels like, hey, I want to make a buck. And, you know, this last movie was a big hit and I've got something like that. Then, you know, they, they just feel like that's going to be they're not going to do the, as good a job as if they come up with something that they really love and have some kind of personal connection to it. Um, and, you know, my approach to to that live pitching is, is we start with the personal connection, which is why this idea is meaningful to, you You know, it's kind of like the way you get into the pitch is you don't just start with, you know, we open on. Um, a cliff and a guy's standing on the edge, you know, like you want to engage them and talk about something from your life um, that's going to apply to this story to explain why, you know, this is something, a passion project for you. Um, everybody wants a passion project. And, you know, it's, it's so, I think in anything, it's so much work, right? It's so much work to put out a book, so much work to make a movie, um, so much work to do a play. And nobody wants to do that unless they really feel like they're going to, you know, enjoy the process. They're going to spend that much time. They want to enjoy the process. So, so yeah, I think, you know, it is all about um, coming out and pitching a great, a great story in the room. Very good. I have another question. I know um, like in the art world and even in the publishing world, they like to have a multiple of work because if you do tend to be a, the successful one, right? You're the diamond in the rough or you're the, the vein that they've tapped <laughs> uh, and to have some other uh, works uh, that can follow suit and continue to generate revenue. Is that the same for scripts or, or do scripts kind of stand alone? Because I, I don't really know too many script writers that say, you know, I've had 14 other scripts like that and they're all rolled <laughs> into production. Whereas maybe an art show may roll that way or even a book publishing may roll that way. Yeah, I mean, I think it is different for, for the movie side of the business, certainly. TV is, is kind of a different animal, but, um, you know, like I think for, like let's compare it to a, to a, a novelist or, or an artist, right? Like usually it's so much work to break in someone new. Right, because nobody knows them, so there's no fan base, anything like that. So a publisher, an agent, anybody like that is going to want to know that that once they do it, they can keep doing it. And, and to some extent, the same thing is true in, in movies, right? With an agent, the agent one, doesn't want to make a, one deal; they want to make a lot of deals. So they want to know you have more in you. But um, you know, movies aren't sold by the screenwriter. So you know, like like the way that art and novels are sold by the writer. So um, you know, they'll buy a movie from a writer, they don't worry too much about what that writer can do in the future. You know, what they're really interested in is, can I get an, a movie star in this that people will know? Cause that's what'll bring people in. Um, can I get a director, even though directors generally don't bring in a lot of audience, but they attract movie stars. So it's a lot of it's about the star. So 
so yeah, so one-off sales, um, you know, that certainly is a, uh, that's the reality of the, of the movie business. But of course, agents and managers, you know, your first deal is usually not a very big deal. Um, in many cases, like we were talking about, the movie doesn't ever get made, um, which is when you really start to make real income. Um, so they want to know that you're not, like if you just have one life story script in you, probably not too many people are going to be interested. It's also why, you know, I think there's a, a myth out there that Hollywood just buys ideas, but um, that's not really the case because, you know, an idea is a lot of work, right? They have to find a writer who's going to write that and turn that into something. And um, there's a lot of idea, you know, they get hundreds of thousands of things every year brought, sent in in one form or another. So ideas are not the hard part. It's, you know, getting the people who can, who can bring that skill to it. So if it's just, you know, I have this one great idea or I have like a life story that's interesting, that's a harder sell really than, you know, I'm a skilled professional that can, that can do good work. Right, all right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Hollywood Pitching Bible. Um, how did that come about? So, um, yeah, so that became, it, it, as I mentioned, it kind of grew out of this class I taught with Caraguado and we decided to, to work together to write the book. Um, and it kind of, um, you know, we really wrote it just for our class initially. Um, That's right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it really sort of took off um, uh, because I think, like one thing is there's not a lot of books out there on pitching. There's, there is a couple others, um, you know, and I, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna, the, the only thing about the other pitching books I'll say is that they're, they're a little old. So they're, you know, they haven't been updated for a decade or more. So, you know, the business changes. So we had an advantage in that, you know, ours is more recent. We actually just released the fourth edition um, because it, as you may have noticed, a lot of things are changing very quickly right now in the movie business. And we had this little pandemic that kind of <laughs> changed things. So um, we added a whole section on Zoom pitching. So um, yeah, so the, the book is now, it's actually used as a textbook in several different colleges. Um, but you know, we had a very gratifying response. Uh, we solicited quotes from filmmakers and so forth that we knew, and you know, a lot of people kind of said, uh, "Oh, this is great. This is what I've always done, but I never really could explain it." You know, and you guys explained it. You figured it out. So, um, so yeah. So I think like our goal really with the book is to teach um, you know teach people how to structure a pitch so it best communicates the idea. And and, and as I said, like it is not intuitive. It is not the thing you it does not work the way you would think it would work or the way that you naturally work as a writer. So we kind of come up with um, what amounts to a six step plan. Um, it's obviously gets more complicated than that, but you know, like um, we start with, as I mentioned, the personal connection, not something we came up with. Many people talk about the personal connection as a, as a way to start a pitch where you kind of explain why this is meaningful to you and, and where your heart lies in this, uh, which is really a way to talk about the theme of the, uh, in a way that doesn't sound um, cheesy you know, when you do it kind of in the context of story and you want to talk about the thematic resonance, right? The personal connection is a way to do that. Um, you know, and then we just kind of like lay out a process for building out your, your pitch based on your story um, and then translating that into all the different forms, whether that's a synopsis or, you know, whether you're pitching for an assignment, which is a little different because you start usually with an analysis of the material, what it is and what it isn't. Um, and, uh, it, you know, kind of how to pitch we go into specifics like reality TV, pitching as a director, all these different uh, forms. Wow. So the pitching Bible covers a lot of ground, a yeah. different type of, okay, that's originated out of the class. Um, now, can you get the book outside of the class or is sure. that? Okay, good. Well, be sure to give us all those links at the <laughs> end of it. This <laughs> uh, sounds like a, a good book for those who are interested in learning the art of pitching, which sounds like it's an art form. So, <laughs> well, let's talk about, um, I know you've talked about some of the struggles and, you know, what was working, what wasn't working. So let's dive into maybe some of the biggest mistakes uh, writers make when pitching their projects. Yeah, so the, the, I think the single biggest mistake, certainly the biggest mistake I made starting out is really just focusing on plot. Um, and it's kind of like when you're told, all right, pitch something, right? Tell them your story. Um, and you have 10 minutes in a meeting or, or 15 minutes is what you should expect to, to do it. Uh, you know, so what you do is like, well, where does the story start? And you just start telling the plot of your story. But, um, you know, 
like one thing is the most boring type of pitches, this happens and then this happens and then that happens, um, you know, which is a very plot way of pitching. Um, and the other thing to really understand is that people don't really buy plot. Um, they buy, but they buy concept and they buy character. So, um, you know, so I think the first mistake is, is really being focused on plot and also being too detailed on the plot. Um, you always have to say what happens. Um, when you're doing a pitch for a movie, well, again, there's different pitching situations. When you're doing a formal pitch, you're, you're generally expected to pitch the entire movie beginning to end. Um, because you're in, in a formal pitch, you're really asking them to give you a lot of money to write it, right? So, you know, it has to feel worked out. They're not going to give you a lot of money unless they know that you really have it worked out. Um, but again, I think like the, um, the challenge is to really think of it as you're telling a story. And the same requirements of, of writing a good story um, are there in the pitch which means, you know, characters are way into a story. So you have to tell the pitch kind of from the point of view of the character, but which I don't mean you like, you don't act out the, the character, it's not that, but you know, you don't wanna be saying, um, you know, Melanie uh, goes here, uh, Melanie had, you know, I'm trying to think of like how Sweet Home Alabama, right? You know, Melanie goes to, uh, to her fashion show and um, she's very, you know, it, it goes well and then she goes to the, uh, gets picked up by the limo driver and then she goes to Tiffany's and then, you know, they turn on the lights and her boyfriend's there and he proposes to her. Like that's a very dry plot based way of pitching and it just doesn't engage the reader. So you'd want to kind of try to get into Melanie's head a little bit and say, you know, Melanie is having her first fashion show and she's extremely nervous. Everything's going crazy, but she's, she's really good and, and is able to kind of like fix all the problems as, as it goes along. And you know, the fashion show ends and everything's really celebratory and she's ready to just relax. So She's gonna go meet her boyfriend, um, but the limo driver takes her to some strange place that she doesn't know where she is. So you get kind of the differences between those two is that the first one is very like, this happens, this happens, this happens. The second one is getting us in the head of the, the character. And the other piece of it is being too detailed. So even what I just did is really probably too detailed um, because you have to condense that two hours down to, to that 15 minutes. So, um, so plot kind of is the enemy of the pitch is what I like to say. Um, and you, you have to go through the plot points, but really you want to try to pull out as much of that detail as you can and get to the, the story, which is really the character and their experience and what's at stake for them and what their goal is and, and, you know, kind of take the audience through that. Um, other big problems I see is, you know, you want to make sure you're showing enthusiasm, whatever that looks like for you. I mean, I know writers, including me, are not always so outgoing. Um, and, you know, we're not necessarily going to jump up and act out scenes and everything. But um, if you seem like you're bored by your own story, it's going to be awfully difficult to convince them that this is something they want. <laughs> so, you know, if you're doing a verbal pitch, certainly you want to um, do that. Um, other tough things I know, like um, really understanding what the listener doesn't understand. Um, you know, you've lived with the story for so long in many cases, you kind of take for granted sometimes that they, that they're understanding things and really, you know, you sometimes don't know what you're not saying. So um, I really believe you have to test out your pitches, you know, your, or your summaries or whatever. You have to give them to people and say like, what's confusing? Where do you get lost? Um, because it's just too often you just take things for granted. Even things like I've seen um, writers like pitch something that's period and never mention when it takes place, right? <laughs> Cause it's like in their head, it's so clear. And then the listeners going like, wait, is this 1700? I don't understand what's happening here. So, you know, why is everybody using swords? Um, so, um, that might so be the obvious sign right there. Right. Yeah. But still not so obvious because swords have been used for a while. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So like, yeah. Or even just saying something like, um, one of the things we, I, I hear a lot is like, you know, it's about a young girl. And I'm like, okay, so you mean five? Do you mean 15? Even possibly 25 people would say that, you know, like that's, that's not a clear statement. So really kind of understanding what you have to do to, to communicate. Um, you know, it's, it's like I said, testing it out, being specific, understanding what they don't know. Um, and actually that's another one is sort of generic characters. Um, you want to, you don't want to ever really say that, you know, it's about a guy, you know, like that doesn't tell me anything. Or, or even just character names are another one. Um, you obviously, you'd want to use a character's name in a pitch, right? Or in a, in a summer, you don't just want to, you know, but, but we also advocate um, a log line. Uh, so a log, log lines, um, meaning a short, uh, sometimes one sentence, it doesn't have to be one sentence, but usually like 
50 words or less description of what the idea is. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll say something like, this is about Joe. And I'm like, well, okay, I don't know who Joe is. So that doesn't really help me. So you want to give some kind of description of the character. So, um, you know, really trying to make that person specific. Like Joe is a, um, you know, an introverted scientist, something like that. Like, okay, now I have some information that will, that will help me. And then connecting that character, you know, another big thing um, is, is kind of getting that the character in sync with the drama, um, meaning that, that there's a reason why this character is in this story beyond just the fact that they were there, you know, that there's something about the character's personality or their flaw or whatever that is going to be tested by this story, or it's a growth that they need to go through. So describing the character in a way that then sort of pays off with whatever your premise of your, of your story is. So, you know, kind of those sorts of skills, I think really help. That's where we, we're getting into like, you know, what's cool about the idea. Right. Um, so trying to avoid, yeah, generic things. Um, That's a great tip. Now, is there any timeline or gauge that usually pitches are expected to take? Are they, you know, 15 minutes, an hour? <laughs> what, is there any particular time that they, they need to probably shine <laughs> right. in a very short time? <laughs> right. Well, in a, you know, in a formal pitch meeting, um, the kind of the rule of thumb tends to be 15 minutes uh, maximum. I think attention spans are shrinking, um, you know, everywhere, but also in Hollywood executives. And uh, 10 minutes is probably now more common than 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, really kind of keeping it tight. Um, people will do pitches, you know, they go 30, 40, 45 minutes. I don't think that's a smart way to go. Um, and really, I kind of believe like, you sell something in the first two minutes, right? And then after that, it's all about not unselling it. We actually use that term sometimes, don't unsell <laughs> your, your pitch, right? So if they haven't decided they like this thing in the first two minutes, you're probably never gonna get them. So that's, you know, it's really, that's why it's really important to have that, that kind of log line, that concept that makes them lean in and say, oh, that's interesting, I wanna know more. Um, you know, if, if you can't get that within two minutes, you're probably not gonna get it. Um, and that happens, you know, like sometimes that's okay because, um, you know, Again, the, the goal of pitching really is not um, coming with a crappy idea and convincing someone to pay you for it. <laughs> the, goal, the goal is to, to like have this idea that you love and finding someone that's gonna be able to shepherd it the way you want it. You know, every, you know, ultimately the goal is, is it's not about making money, it's about getting the right stories to the right people so that they can get out to the biggest audience that's gonna appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so, so you really wanna try to like capture what's the genuine nature of your story in those first two minutes, get them interested. And then, and then kind of like the longer you go, almost the worse it can be. So, cause, cause you have more and more opportunities for them to go, Oh, wait a minute. Maybe now I don't like it as much as I yeah. thought I did. Yeah. So it really goes the other way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes less is more <laughs> on many levels. Yeah. And they're also, you know, that, so that's more of a formal pitch, but there are many kind of informal pitching situations. And there's even, even other formal situations, like there's pitch fests now where you can come pitch to executives. Um, and usually you get about five minutes to sit down at a table with, with two or three or four executives. And you don't want to do a five minute pitch because you want to have some time for questions and exchanging business cards or whatever. So really a two minute pitch is, is what you want to do there. But you also want to understand the nature of those kind of events, which is nobody's going to give you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for your idea at a pitch fest. You're, the best case scenario is you're going to say, send me that script. So I would always pitch something that's already written at a pitch fest. And that's the other thing. If you're pitching something that's written, your task is a little different because you don't want to tell them the whole story, right? That's what, if you do that, they don't need to read it. So the goal is to get them to read it. And then you're really just trying to kind of engage them in what the idea and the concept is. And again, their less is more. So the more you tell them, the more they start to feel like, well, maybe I don't have to read this. I already know everything that's gonna, that's gonna happen. Kind of like a good trailer for a movie doesn't give away everything in the movie. Right, right. So when you're pitching, do, is it just a one-on-one -on -one with them kind of, you no know, story or do you send them like a query or a synopsis? Uh, it can be all different kinds of ways. Uh, you know, like the, again, the traditional um, way, which, does still happen and all of that is, um, so often you you get the pitch meeting because they've read something of yours they really like, or they, or, you know, you've had a movie made that was really good and people want to meet the writer of that movie. And um, 
uh, or you know, there's an, if there's an open writing assignment where there's something like that, then you send them sample work, um, and then um, they'll have sent you whatever that thing is. So there's some exchange ahead of time, usually beyond just you know, um, my agent or manager will send them the log line uh, of the idea if I'm pitching an original idea in a, in a regular pitch. Um, but you know, the pitch carries the weight. Um, it can be one-on-one, -on -one. it can be, you know, two or three people, a lot of times an assistant's there to take notes. Um, sometimes there's two or three executives there to, to listen. Um, I have occasionally pitched to like 20 people, um, you know, when there's, you know, and that probably the, the most people I pitched to was a case of, you know, there was like a two producers and a financier and, you know, a director and, and all of their assistants and everybody. So this is a project that was already kind of like going forward and they needed a very quick rewrite. And so I was pitching like how I would do that. Um, but more often than not, it's, it's one to three people that you're pitching directly to. Um, and occasionally I have other people on, on my side of the table, you know, my manager might come with me or if I'm working with a producer and we're pitching to a studio, you know, there's other people in the room, but the writer is really expected to be the one that, that tells the story. Um, so they may set it up a little bit, but then I have to, to pitch my idea. Well, that leads me into um, my next question, which is how do writers get pitch meetings in Hollywood? So, yeah, that's what everybody, you know, how do I get that meeting? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we know what goes down in a pitch, but how do you get there? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the thing is, like, the first thing is, is again, I want to disabuse anybody who may have that, that uh, kind of impression of Hollywood as, as just looking for this high concept ideas. Um, you know, you don't get that meeting because you have an idea. So you, you have to start with producing some great work, right? And, and, you know, just any kind of writing, you're always going to have to do it first. You, nobody's going to hire you to you show that you can do it. Um, and also like, why would they, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, what, what creative job can you get without showing that you actually have the skills to, to get the job? Um, so, very likely they've read something or seen something of yours that they that they really like. Now, of course, most of those formal pitch meetings come from agents, managers. So you have to you know get the agent or manager, which is itself its own big challenge, um, which again usually requires you to produce some great work. You know, not just good work, not just competent work, but something really great and interesting that's going to you know rise above the massive amount of of stuff out there. Um, you know, and then once people have seen something that they like. Um, it's very common then that everybody wants to meet the writer and, and, you know, even if, so there's, there's also general meetings in Hollywood, which is just, I want to meet the writer of this thing um, as the idea is kind of a get to know you meeting um, where they find out, you know, just a little who you are and, and if you're crazy or not, if there's someone they could work with um, and you always pitch something there. And that tends to be a less formal pitch. You know, basically they'll say, what are you working on? And, and you maybe do like a five minute pitch to just kind of, quick summary and and sometimes they'll be like oh i'm interested in that you know and maybe they they might even hire you or buy that that pitch in the room although that's pretty rare particularly these days but um you know it's also a way to kind of demonstrate that you have ideas and the and and who you and just kind of who you are and what your voice is as a as a writer um so you know it's it's not easy but then also um you know if, uh if you've written something that's not if you don't have an agent for a, for a movie, but you've written something else, like maybe you've written a novel that was fairly successful and then they might be kind of interested in meeting with you. Um, and, it, you know, they might be open to, I want to do a pitch, but um, generally that has to be an agented thing to get in, in the room. Oh, good to know. Good to know. Well, that leads me to my next like possibly my last question for you. So what is the best tip for writers selling their projects? Well, I think, you know, the, probably the, my best tip uh, would be, you know, be writing stuff that you really care about. Um, that that's, that's kind of, you know, the, the most important thing is that you have a passion for the project. Um, because again, it is, it is, um, it's an, it's a leap of faith, right? Anytime someone's buying something that's not a completed manuscript screenplay, something like that. Um, it is a, it is, you're asking them to believe in you. And so you kind of have to really believe in the project. And that means you should be writing stuff that you're passionate about. I also think, you know, um, people tend to want to chase the last hot thing or whatever, you know, the, the marketplace is and, and, um, you know, that's everybody, 
else is kind of doing that. And y- your value as a creative artist is, is what's unique about you. So you should be doing this stuff that, you know, that doesn't mean everything has to be autobiographical, of course. Um, but you should be doing stuff that you have a passion for. Um, that's always going to be the stuff that, um, you know, that they're probably going to respond to the most. Um, and really also it's going to make you happier. I think as a writer, you know, if you're spending all this time developing stuff, it should be stuff you like. If you're doing stuff you hate, then you're going to be miserable if it doesn't sell. And you're probably going to be miserable even if it does, because then you have to actually write the thing that you don't really like. Um, so that's probably the, that's probably the, the big tip. Um, I think, you know, some other for, for pitching in general, like, being able to write that good log line that really captures the concept and what's cool about it. That's, that's important. Um, no matter what kind of thing you're writing, um, to really be able to do that well. Um, and, and the thing I mentioned earlier about getting the character really in sync with the story. So making sure that this is a, um, this, there's a reason why this person is in this, uh, situation, you know, beyond just, again, some plot mechanism that, that, to me, that's what, it, to me, story is like the merger of character and plot, right? So you have this stuff that's happening and you have this character who you've developed and like why those two things belong together. That's what a story is. Uh, so really trying to capture that uh, efficiently. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all that. I do have one more question. How can we find out more about you and your a Hollywood pitching Bible and other resources that uh, for any interested listener can uh, obtain and, and uh, click those links and sign up, buy, and get more information about you. Okay. Yeah. So my, I have a website, which is douglasjebach.com. Um, uh, also, um, so the, the Hollywood Pitching Bible and my, my screenwriting book um, and the Felony Melody books are all just available like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and those kind of, of places. Um, but um, the, the Pitching Bible uh, and the Screenplay book are both put out uh, through Screenmaster Books, which is screenmasterbooks.com. You can go there and, and find out you know, some more information about it. Um, uh, if you're not quite sure if you're interested yet or not, you can kind of take a look at, uh, at some more information. There's some other books on there. Um, and then uh, for social media, my my Twitter handle is at Doug Ebach. Um, I, I I failed at the social media marketing thing of keeping all my things the same, so uh, it's at Doug Ebach on Twitter, which is where I do most of my Twitter is probably where I, I do most of like the um, screenwriting and that and and writing type of discussion. So I you know I'm on Instagram and I'm on a Facebook page and all of that, but uh, Twitter is probably where if you're a writer you would be find most interesting stuff from me. Yeah. Doug, I want to thank you for sharing all your great insights, uh, especially for script writing, as I don't, there isn't a whole lot of that out there. So uh, I hope the listeners found some great value. I know I did and learned a lot of new things that I didn't know before. So thank you again for uh taking the time to join us today. And I'd like to thank you all of our listeners for tuning into Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, work through the process and meet others who've done it. So you can be guided to your own journey to write your story. And remember to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. And again, while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media networks. We're looking forward to seeing you next time on the Leap Into Your Story podcast. Thank you for tuning into the Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, break down the process, and meet others who've done it so you can leap into your own story. Remember to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're there, subscribe and like to us via your favorite social media network. We're looking forward to seeing you next time on the Leap Into Your Story podcast.